Okay, everybody, I want to welcome you to tonight's presentation, another edition of Your Life, Your Health. Tonight's topic is, Is the Gut Your Body's Second Brain? by Dr. Diana Maladinoff. We'll probably have some people jumping on here late, but that's okay because I'm recording this. So um, you can also listen in on a podcast later on if you want to stop and take more detailed notes and, and learn a little bit more that way. <clears throat> Uh, also for tonight, during the during the webinar, you can message in questions for Dr. Diana, and we'll try to get them in as much as possible. Now, the first half of the webinar will be mainly a slide presentation, and we'll try to reserve the last half for questions and answers. Now, um, for the next webinar, which I'm going to talk about right now, it is entitled see here. The estrogen, progesterone, testosterone balance in relationship to breast and prostate cancer. That's a mouthful by Dr. Evan Maladinoff. And you can look at these, uh, uh, read the information here, how to access that as usual. You just, you can call in or use your laptop or whatever type of electronic device you are using. Access code is on the bottom of that. Also, in addition to that, guys, as usual, Innovator Sports Training offers private sessions, classes. We do hormonal, biomechanical evaluations, nutritional consultations, sports performance training, and a host of other things. So, phone number is listed there. My email address, istworkshops.webs.com is my website. And also, I have another website, knowyourfoodtype.webs.com. Now, having said that, I am going to introduce Dr. Diana. I've known this young lady for quite a few years. I knew her when she was in high school. In fact, I trained her for a little bit. She's a very uh, well-known holistic practitioner, chiropractor in the state of Arizona. I want to welcome Dr. Diana, and she's going to talk a little bit about her background and what she's doing right now. So welcome to the show, Dr. Diana. Hi. Thank you, Roberto. Thanks for having me. Uh, like Roberto said, I'm a chiropractor. I practiced in Kansas City for about seven years and just moved out to Arizona last year. Um, in Kansas City, I focused on mainly pediatrics and then uh, female hormonal issues. And then I got asked to come out to Arizona and help start a practice for brain care. So we started off with um, oh, let me just grab this. I'll grab my screen, okay. and hopefully you'll be able to see my PowerPoint. Okay, there we go. Sorry, so yes, the brain care. So we started uh, with concussions. So as a former NFL player, I actually used the type of whole body work that we do, plus lifestyle choices to recover from his concussions while he was playing in the NFL, and then he realized there are not a lot of people in the marketplace doing this for people not in the NFL. So I moved out here to Arizona and we've been working on um, kids and adults with concussions um, that have had strokes, people with Asperger's, autism, all these neurological diseases that don't have traditional cures and we're working with them to restore the proper brain metabolism that we need and get those neural networks back on track so that they have improved memory, they don't have brain fog, and a big part of what we do is in clinic training. We do brain wave neurofeedback treatments, we do chiropractic, we do cranial sacral work, cold laser, but a big part of it is patients have to be willing to change a lot of their lifestyle habits and behavior. So some of that is what we're going to talk about today. Because we're going to talk about the big connection between your brain and your gut or your intestines. So first thing we're going to do is, because I'm not sure who's listening, we're just going to go over some brain facts. Mm -hmm. And if anybody has any questions as we go, please you know, don't hesitate. Uh, so just some basic brain facts. Our brain weighs about 3 pounds, so that's about 2% of our body weight. So it's not the largest brain of any animal, but brain size to body size ratio is the largest out of any animal on Earth. So obviously pretty important for us. It uses about 20% of our total oxygen and 20% of our circulating blood. So to be 
so relatively small, but use that much resource. I mean, we all know our brain is pretty important to us. Um, and then it's made up of 75% water. And then people call it the fattest organ because its dry weight consists of 60% fat. So we'll talk about this a little bit later, but these low-fat diets are really not doing good things for our brain. Our brains need that fat, again, the good kind of fat, the proper fat, and we'll get into more of the specifics as we go. Uh, the other thing is, because it is that fatty organ, the consistency of a living brain is that of soft butter. So, you know, we see dry specimens, they're kind of rubbery. It's actually much softer than that. And the reason that's important is the inside of our skull is actually very hard and very rigid. So we have a soft, mushy brain that is very important, does lots of things for our body, in this skull that's not very soft at all. So we have the potential to get hurt and damage much easier than most people think. Then the next big point with that is there are no pain receptors in our brain. So yes, the outside of our head has pain receptors. You feel a headache. If you get cut, scratched, anything on the outside of your head, you can feel that. But our actual brain, no pain receptors. That's right. You know, maybe you've seen on TV they can do surgeries on people's brain while they're still awake. So yes, they've been numbed. To, to cut into the skull and the skin, but no pain receptors on the brain. Big thing for me and my practice with that is when people have these head injuries, they don't experience the pain and the swelling inside their brain. What happens is depending on the region of their brain that gets hurt is what symptoms come out. So if we have the region of the brain that's in charge of motor control, muscle control, now we can't use our muscles as well as we should. Our coordination is off. Our balance is off. If it's back in the back where we have our visual processing, now our vision's off. We might be seeing double vision. We might have tunnel vision. Things like that. So the symptoms help us direct where some of the damage occurred because people can't pinpoint and say this is where it exactly hurts. And you can have this damage without having a headache or any outside scars. Okay? Um, okay. The other thing... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yes, go ahead. I'm just saying, go right ahead. Proceed. Okay. Yep. Uh, the next thing. So, like I said, let's just get some terminology that we're going to talk about a little bit later out of the way. So, neurotransmitters are the chemicals that our brain uses to perform the tasks that it needs to. So, here are the different types of neurotransmitters. So, this first one, acetylcholine, it's what makes our muscles contract, and it also plays a big role in attention, memory, and sleep. So you'll see as we go through this list, some of them do cross over, so we need more than one to actually have proper memory, proper sleep, proper attention. So it's not as easy as, oh my goodness, I have problems with my memory, I need acetylcholine. It'd be nice if it was that cut and dry, but it's not, but that's a big part of knowing, okay, what neurotransmitters am I possibly deficient in, what do I have too much of, so that we can get things back the way they need to, so you can function without the symptoms. Okay, the next one, dopamine. So that's important in body motion and the reward experiences and pleasure. So this is a big one. You know, most people have heard of Parkinson's disease, so they lack the normal levels of dopamine. Now, in case we don't know what Parkinson's is, the big thing that people associate with Parkinson's is called a resting tremor. So that's when you see people, their, especially their hands and their arms, they're not doing anything and they're, they're shaking. But once they go to reach for a pen or they reach for a piece of paper or anything, that tremor is no longer there. So it's only when they're at rest and they're not consciously doing something you see that tremor. But once they initiate a movement, the tremor subsides. So that's different. There's other people that have they are called intention tremors. So at still, they're fine. There's no movement. But once they go to reach for something, then the tremor starts. So again, just slightly different things that damage our brain in different ways different neurotransmitters, but they're clues of what might be going on. Uh, a couple of the other things also associated with Parkinson's are very slow moving and very stiff. So those two are a lot more general. Those could be lots of different things. So don't just think, oh, if I'm slower to move or stiff, I have Parkinson's. So it's not like that, but that is something that goes along with that uh, disease process. Like I said, that is because of an inappropriate level of dopamine. Quick question. Okay, yeah. how is how do you get Parkinson's? Is it from old age? Is it from lifestyle? 
I know we all know about Muhammad Ali that he had it, but how does one, how does Parkinson's evolve? Sure. So no one has the exact answer. So there's lots of different ways. So Muhammad Ali obviously had a lot of severe head trauma with boxing, mm -hmm. right? So basically the point of boxing is to get a concussion, right? So um, even more than football. So, you know, over time that damage to your brain, anytime you have something, whether it's chemical damage, you know, whether it's taking different drugs, whether it's some of these artificial sweeteners that are extremely neurotoxic to our brain, uh, so that we shouldn't be consuming those at all. So different chemical exposure, whether it's physical trauma, like with the boxing, or even emotional trauma. So if you've witnessed, you know, terrible events, if you, you know, PTSD with some of the veterans, so you can have PTSD but not be a veteran, like somebody in a civilian life can witness something horrible and traumatic, and it just causes these chain reactions that make our brain start working in different ways. And if we're not supporting our brain and the rest of our body properly to make the right levels of these neurotransmitters, then that's how disease processes start. So there's not one thing that says, oh, if you do this, you're going to end up with Parkinson's. Does that make sense? Okay. So unfortunately with our body, everything is such a cascade of how it works that you can't just say, do this one thing and you won't get this, or do this one thing and you will. So you cannot. So, so, you, so, you, uh, so you can't piecemeal it then, right? Uh, you mean like picking? You mean like picking and choosing what good things you want to do and what bad things you want to do? Correct. Is that what you mean? Right. Correct. So obviously, the, the more things you do to improve your health and your well-being, the better chance you have of not getting these. But there are some people that, like Muhammad Ali, were boxers that didn't have Parkinson's, right? So. Do we know exactly what everybody was eating, what they, what their childhood was like? So again, not as simple as one, two, three. Okay. But that's why you know all these little things that we can do to improve where we already are to keep us from going in that deterioration pattern. Does that kind of help? Yes, ma'am. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, so next, so endorphins. Lots of people, you know, it's probably the one most people have heard of. Um, the natural opiates, they block pain. This is what, you know, people say with their exercise high. So endorphins are the good guys. They make us feel good. We all like them. So then this next one, GABA, that is the most common inhibitory neurotransmitter. So we normally think of inhibitory or inhibition as a negative thing, but it's not. So we can't, all our muscles can't be turned on at the same time. We can't be going 24-7 nonstop. That's not how our body works. It's not how it should work. So we do have to have some of these neurotransmitters that say, okay, it's time to stop. Let's put a stop to this now. So they help calm down nerve activity. They help normalize brain waves, and they keep anxiety in check. Right? So that's one of those big ones. If you just think about it, someone who's anxious, you know, very nervous all the time, like they're running way too much. So they don't, you, chances are not enough of this GABA neurotransmitter to come in and calm everything back down. And if you just think if everything's running at 100% all the time, you're going to get wiped out and fatigued much easier than someone who is actually able to be excited and nervous at appropriate times and then calm down when it's appropriate. So all of, that's the other thing I just want to mention, all the different emotions and behaviors are appropriate at certain times, right? So there are times to be anxious and nervous and even scared. It's okay. But because if you're not anxious, nervous, and scared in certain situations, then you might do things that are dangerous to you, dangerous to others, right? But we don't want that to be overtaking your whole life where now you're so anxious that you can't walk out of your house or you can't go to a mall because you're worried about all the surrounding situations. So what we need is the balance of appropriate times to be nervous, right? Like let's say there's a car accident or you see somebody coming at you. Of course, appropriate time to be nervous and afraid, right? But short term, so it has to turn on and then turn off at the appropriate time. Okay, um, the next one is called glutamate. So that's important for our cognition, our learning, and our memory. So again, we got multiple ones that are important for learning and memory because it's a very complicated process for us to be able to do that. Interesting thing about glutamate is that in small amounts, 
it's excitatory for our brain, but in large amounts it becomes neurotoxic. So again, that fine balance of if now we have too much, way too much excitement on the brain, brain can't handle it because we're done, we're starting to kill off these nerves. Okay. Then the next one, norepinephrine. So there's epinephrine and norepinephrine. They help regulate our mood, our blood pressure, our heartbeat, and our arousal. So one of the things people always talk about with these ones is, you know, if a saber-toothed tiger comes at you, <laughs> these things shoot through the roof so that you can either run away from that tiger or you can fight that tiger. Right? So they call it fight or flight. And certain things have to happen. If you're in that mode of fight or flight, two things that really do not need to be working in your body are your digestion and your immune system. Okay? You don't need to be worrying about fighting off bugs and other things like that or digesting your food if you're trying to run away from a threat. Okay, then, on the flip side, you should be calmed down. It's called rest and digest. So now, that's when your body calms down. You should be able to sleep, you be able to digest your food, have bowel movements. So what happens is, if these two things are out of balance, again, everything in our body is about the proper balance. If these two things get too out of balance, just think about our lives. We've got stress after stress after stress, like, oh, I have this meeting, now I have to go do this. I don't get the right amount of sleep that I need, so I don't recover from everything I did to myself today. You know, we've got a lot of people that are constipated. It's because they're running on this kind of fight or flight all the time. So again, some of the things we're going to talk about in the next little bit is going to help that, but as you can see, we're kind of already setting ourselves up in our daily lives for a lot of these disease processes. Okay, so that's what, like I said, we're going to try and as minimum as minimize all the different threats that we can. Because you can't stop living your life, you can't keep away from stress, I mean, we've got to go to work, we've got to do things, but we want to make sure they're not hurting us on the back end. Uh, and then the last one, serotonin, so that's crucial for proper sleep and appetite. And then improper levels of serotonin have been linked to depression and anxiety. So depression and anxiety are big ones, it's hard to even imagine how many Americans are taking drugs for anxiety and depression. And what's interesting is now, I don't know if you've seen commercials, is they say if you're taking depression medication and now you're constipated, <laughs> now you need another medication, right? So there, be, and I think it might even be in the next slide. So 80 to 90 percent of our serotonin, so this chemical that's important for sleep and appetite, is made in our intestines. So if we're taking medication that affects that neurotransmitter, of course it's going to affect your intestines, which is now why you're constipated. So just interesting things that you know we see with people that unfortunately some of the medications create a bigger problem, or sometimes the side effects of the medications are the exact same things that people are experiencing, which is unfortunate. Okay, uh, so this I just put this up here. When you start talking to people about your intestines being related to your brain. Sometimes they kind of look at you like this doesn't make any sense what you're talking about. So especially with the population of people that I see, you say, okay, uh, most people when they have a concussion or a head injury, they vomit, right? Mm -hmm. And that kind of that's the light bulb for them. Like, okay, yeah, why do they vomit, right? Maybe there is a connection, right? The other thing that happens is I don't know if any of our listeners have had a head injury or know someone that has. Most people that have head injuries lose their appetite, right? So again, another direct connection between your head and your intestines where they seem like they're far away from each other, but there is a connection and we're going to talk exactly about what that connection is. So yeah, that's big for people that have these head injuries and even some of these neurological diseases is that their appetite goes away or they start craving things that they did not eat before. And unfortunately, the things they crave are usually the worst things for them. Okay? Like, like sugar and sweets? Correct, yeah. So the sugars, the carbs, uh, you know, it tastes good and that's what they want. And they keep more and more and more of it and we kind of, the word we use, carboholic, right? So you just can't stop eating it and your body's craving it and now it just wants more and more and more of it and it's a disaster for our body. Okay? Uh, then the next thing, you know, why in our just general, when we talk, we say, oh, I had a gut feeling. Well, you know, has anybody thought about why we say that? Well, like I said, most of those neurotransmitters, which are what our brain uses to make all its connections and do what it needs to do, are made in our intestines. So our intestines actually have the capacity like our brain does. 
right? So that connection is still there, gut feeling. Or why when people get nervous, do they lose, they get nauseous, they lose their appetite, right? So all these little things that, unless you start thinking about it, you're like, who thinks that their stomach's related to their brain? Sorry, their intestines related to their brain. It seems kind of out there until you start piecing some of these things together. Okay, so just some fun little pictures. Um, next thing I did, so we're just going to talk a little bit about those connections. So, you know, this is way back from school, so we're not going to dwell on it, but it's important to say. So our brain, spinal cord, and our intestinal tract are all made from that same embryonic fetal tissue. So you're basically real simple when we're developing as a fetus. Lots of different types of tissue turn into different things and then grow and mature into different parts of our body. So these are the three things, right? So our brain, spinal cord, and intestines all made from the same material. So that's pretty important, right? So even our system thinks, okay, these three things are pretty important. We're going to keep them tied together, okay? So the next thing, our brain and our intestines communicate back and forth through the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve is one of our 12 cranial nerves. Cranial nerves are nerves that go right are right from your brain. So besides those 12 cranial nerves, all other nerves travel through our spinal cord and then out to nerves. Okay, so these 12 are pretty important. And I actually, num number 10, which like I said, the name is the vagus nerve, is the one that goes from our brain to our intestine. So I just, I, to me, it's always very interesting how our body works. So out of the 12 cranial nerves, one of them is for our smell, one is for our sight, Three of them are to move our eyeballs. One is on the feeling and the sensations of our face. One is on the muscles of our face. One is for hearing and balance. One is for our tongue muscles. And then one is for our SCMs and our traps. So basically the front neck muscles and then our traps on the back of our neck. And then that last one is for your intestines. So for everything else out of those 12 to be on your head and a little bit of your neck, and then one thing on your intestines. So again, body thinks our intestines are pretty important. So to me, when I kind of saw that, I thought, this is pretty powerful. The other interesting thing is, like I said, three out of the 12 are just to move our eyes. So yes, our eyes are very important. Our eyes are actually brain tissue. But how our eyes move is important with the posture of the rest of our body. So again, that's why three separate nerves are for our eyeballs. But like I said, one is all the way down to those intestines. So pretty important to do that. Then this next fact, like we mentioned, 80 to 90% of that serotonin is produced in our intestines. So again, serotonin is important for sleep and appetite. Improper levels lead to anxiety and depression. Um, one thing we're going to talk a little bit about sleep, and it, it really hit me when someone actually said this to me. <laughs> they said, we use sleep deprivation as a form of torture, right? So if you're not getting the proper sleep, it is like torture, right? So everything you did today, if you don't recover overnight while you're sleeping properly, the next day is just miserable. And then add on and on and on. Other big thing is if you are not dreaming at night, you're not sleeping properly, right? So if you don't dream during any time that you sleep, you're not getting to the right restorative kind of sleep. You're basically just passing out for X number of hours depending on you know, how long your eyes are closed. But if it's not, you don't get to the dream state of sleep, you're not sleeping the right amount. And as we're going to talk about, so some of these neurotransmitters related to sleep are going to relate back to our intestines. So for so we should, things that are... Question, so we should dream every yeah. night then, right? Correct, yeah. Even if it's a bad dream. Correct, yeah. So to me, <laughs> you know, that's something else we could get into dream analysis, right? But no, to me... It, the type of dream that you have is not important. It's just that you ha wake up in the morning, remember you had a dream, then as your day goes on, you forget what that dream is, and that's fine. You don't need to remember it. But when you wake up in the morning, did I have a dream? Do I remember having a dream? You know, and sometimes we should have multiple dreams at night. So hmm. really important that that's what we're having. Now, some medications, some sleep medications are going to prevent that from happening. And then a lot of people that have head injuries don't dream. Right? So like I said, they're basically just passing out, and it's not doing their body any favors. They wake up, they don't feel rested, they just feel just as groggy, just as miserable. So big part of 
sleep, like I said, is going to be these neurotransmitters, which are from our intestines. So getting our intestines back on track is going to be big to help sleep. Okay. Uh, then the this last one, so GALT, gut associated lymphatic tissue, is our gut's own immune system, and it actually makes up 70 to 80 percent of the body's immune system. Okay. So the immune system is really important to our body, right? It helps us protect us from invaders that come in. And what happens now we have all these autoimmune diseases. What that means is our body can no longer recognize what is me versus what is something that's coming from the outside and dangerous to me. So my body starts attacking itself, right? So now our immune systems run havoc on everything. And now this is when people start getting allergies. Uh, they start, you know, they have Hashimoto's. It's a thyroid autoimmune disease. So again, if our immune system, which majority of it's in our intestines, is not working properly, let's look to our intestines. Okay. So this is kind of nitty gritty of what we're getting down to is our gut bacteria. So I, I've seen a big term. More people know more about good bacteria versus bad bacteria, which is really good. But again, just in case we don't, not all bacteria is bad, right? So uh, we think, okay, strep throw all these different kinds of bad bacteria where we have to take antibiotics to get rid of it. This is true. Yeah, not all of them are good, but we do have bacteria in our intestines that help us digest food. They help us make these neurotransmitters. They do a lot of good things. So we just need to make sure, again, the balance of good guys outweighs the, what's bad. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about here a little bit more. So gut bacteria weighs about three to four pounds in our intestines. So again, about the same weight as our brain. So another thing, it's like, okay, these guys are pretty important. Things in our intestine are helping our brain, and our brain is helping our intestines. Okay, then there's over 10,000 species of microbes that have been identified. And there's still some that I'm sure will be identified you know, after this lecture. But basically that breaks it down to, for every one human gene in our body, there are 360 microbe genes. Okay, so we have a lot more bacteria genes in us than human genes. Okay, and like I said, not all of them are bad. It's when the bad overtake the good is when we start expressing them and getting infections, things like that. Okay, uh, so then these gut bacteria are crucial to the health of our heart, our lungs, our liver, our brain, and our immune system. So they do a lot of good things, and we need to make sure that we help protect them. Okay, then gut bacteria send signals to immune cells that release inflammatory chemicals as our first line of defense. So. Our immune system, like we're saying here, first line of defense. Something comes into our body, that immune system has to say, okay, are you a good guy or are you a bad guy? What am I going to do about it? And it, if it's a bad guy, it's going to release these inflammatory chemicals to take care of it. And it's the gut bacteria that help signal those immune systems that you're not doing, sorry, that an invader has come in. So interesting little thing, little kids, why do they put everything in their mouth? Right? That's where they're learning. So their intestines and their immune system are trying to figure out what's me, what's not me. Right? So that's why they, again, you don't want them putting everything in their mouth, but that's why they do it. You watch them, it's like everything. Why are they doing that? Their body is trying to figure out what exactly is going on. Okay? So then while this gut bacteria helps the immune system release the inflammatory chemicals, it also helps decrease chronic inflammation. So inflammation in short terms is good. Just think about it. You sprain your ankle. It swells up protect things from getting worse, but if your ankle stays swelled now for, you know, a year, that's not good, right? So there's, a, again, a balance between short-term inflammation, which is good and necessary, and then chronic inflammation, which start, is causing lots of other problems. And that gut bacteria helps take care of the balance. So again, gut bacteria produces GABA, right? That's that inhibitory neurotransmitter that keeps things down, keeps them calm. It, produce, it helps produce glutamate. And then it helps produce BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And what that does, it encourages brain, uh, sorry, brain growth protein, which produces, protects neurons and encourages synapses. So synapses are how those neurons, those nerve cells communicate to each other. So this is crucial for us for learning and thinking. So think about it. If you have this BDNF not as much as you should, we're obviously going to have some problems creating those synapses and protecting the neurons that we already have. So decreased BDNF is associated with Alzheimer's, epilepsy, anorexia, depression, schizophrenia, and OCD. Okay, now, so now I have, 
Diana, just for a second, I have read <laughs> that BDNF is basically growth hormone for the brain. Not yeah, tech. yeah. So it's a great way to think about it, right? Yeah, I mean, so not not technically, but in reality, it correct. is a growth hormone for the brain. Correct. Yes. Yep. So, and that's what it's doing. It's helping protect what we already have, and then it's encouraging things to get, you know, so our brain's not bigger and stronger, like muscles, right? But more connections, more communication, which then leads to more function. Okay. Right. Does that kind of help? But yeah, I like that analogy. That's really good. So one of the big keys is aerobic exercise helps increase that BDNF, right? So aerobic exercise, really good to help stimulate your brain. Other thing that helps increase that BDNF is omega-3 fats. So we can just mention real quick, omega-3 fats are the anti-inflammatory fats, whereas omega-6 fats are the pro-inflammatory fats, okay? So again, the omega-3s, those anti-inflammatory fats are the fats that we want, so people call the good fats, right? Things like avocado, salmon, tuna, coconut oil, okay? Some people take the fish oils, right? Or you can take an algae oil. So those things plus aerobic exercise really help increase BDNF. But we need to make sure we have the right gut bacteria too, because if you just do those two things, but your gut bacteria is off, you're not going to have the good result. Okay? Balance. Uh, then, go ahead. I just said balance is balance is the key, right? Right, exactly, exactly. So that's going to be kind of a theme of everything we talk about, right? Because too much of one thing is not good, not enough of it also not good. Uh, so then this is just, like I said, some facts. we got the two most common types of gut organisms we have are formiculites and bacteriodites. Interesting thing, so they've found that formiculites increase our fat absorption. It's, so that means we can now hold on to the fat even more. Okay, so high amounts of these formiculites have been found in obese individuals, and the increase has also been shown to on genes that increase the risk of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. So, yes, again, we need them, but we don't want them to be the overpowering organism. We want those bacteriodites to be more. So, what decreases formiculites? Aerobic exercise, right? So now we've got aerobic exercise, those two good things for our brain. It helps decrease these fat absorbing gut bacteria and then it increases the BDNF, right? So a pretty good idea to get some aerobic exercise in, which I'm sure is not news to anybody that's listening, but it's always nice to hear it. <laughs> um, then just to, you know, they do all this research and say, okay, is gut bacteria actually something that is beneficial or do we just want it? Is that, you know, what we're thinking? So they take rats in the lab, they completely wiped out all their bacteria. So they're germ-free rats. What happens? These rats now have acute anxiety, inability to handle stress, chronic gut and systemic inflammation, decreased BDNF, so that um, brain growth factor, increased cortisol. Cortisol is our stress hormone. So basically, there's two hormones that increase as we age, cortisol and insulin. That's not good. We do not want those things increasing as we age. And again, we'll go into how to keep those down, but just taking the bacteria out increased that cortisol. These rats also showed more risk taking. And then all these symptoms were reversed when they added probiotics, which that's the way of saying the good bacteria. Right? So just adding in probiotics took away all these symptoms in a rat. Okay? So now this gut check quiz I got from Dick, um, Dr. David Paul Muter. Uh, so we can go through the questions and you can think about yourself if you have kids or anybody you know in your life. We'll just go through, we, I'll read through the questions real quick. So did your mother take antibiotics when she was pregnant with you? Okay, so again, antibiotics are killing the bad guys that you have. They're also killing all the good guys. So they're wiping out everything. So yes, you need to take antibiotics at some time for certain bacteria infections. But then we have to make sure we repopulate the good guys at the end of that. Okay, so it's not don't ever take antibiotics, not saying that. You need it, take it, but then let's make sure we get the good guys back in there. Okay? Um, then did your mother take steroids like prednisone while she was pregnant with you? Were you born by C-section? Uh, were you breastfed for less than one month? Did you suffer from frequent ear and or throat infections as a child? Did you require ear tubes as a child? Did you have your tonsils removed? 
Have you ever needed steroid medications for more than one week, including steroid, nasal, or breathing inhalers? Right, so asthma, right, another very common childhood illness. Uh, can we tie back to gut bacteria? Okay. Uh, do you take antibiotics at least once every two to three years? Do you take acid blocking drugs for digestion or reflux? Then on this next page, are you gluten sensitive? Do you have food allergies? Are you extra sensitive to chemicals often found in everyday products and goods? Have you been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease? Do you have type 2 diabetes? Are you more than 20 pounds overweight? Do you suffer from irritable bowel syndrome? Do you have diarrhea or loose bowel movements at least once a month? Do you require a laxative at least once a month? And do you suffer from depression? Okay, so that's a long list of questions, and some of them might seem out there like, what does this have to do with anything? But we'll kind of go over some of that. But basically the bottom line, um, he says to this quizzes, the more yeses you have, the more likely your intestinal bacteria is out of balance. But don't worry, there's still something you can do about it. It's not, okay, my gut bacteria is out of whack, I'm going to be like this forever. No, there's things that you can change, lifestyle changes to make to get things back on track. So, you know, all of us can't help what our mother did when she was pregnant with us, but knowing that, saying, okay, this is a potential that I need to work on, okay, now there is still something I can do later in my life, okay? So, why does that actually matter if you're born by a C-section? So, again, the studies shown infants born vaginally obtain the colonies from the birth canal, which are primarily beneficial lactobacillus, whereas infants born by a C-section acquire the colonies from the skin, which are mostly harmful streptococcus. Again, not saying don't ever have a C-section or if you were born by C-section, you know, there's no hope. If C-section is necessary, do that. But now we know, okay, baby needs to make sure we get some probiotics for the baby. Okay, so again, not saying don't ever do it. We're not against it, but it shows that, okay, we're going to have some deficits. Let's make sure we handle it. Okay, then the other kind of whammy is during a C-section, they usually give the mother's antibiotics because it's a surgery. So now we're killing off everything that mom has too. So again, just if we know that that's the case, let's make sure on the back end we start getting some probiotics. And we're going to go over foods that have probiotics in them a little bit later on. Okay. Then the other thing they studied, individuals born by C-section, fivefold increase in the risk of allergies. Right. So food allergies are becoming very um, popular is the wrong word because popular sounds like it's a good thing. but Prevalent. More and more common. Sorry, what did you say? Yeah, more prevalent. Yes, exactly. Uh, when they shouldn't be. So, and even food sensitivities. So, it not, might be a full-blown allergy, but who are getting more sensitive to things more often. And so, this could be part of it as we see C-section increasing. And now we know it's because we're not getting the bacteria that we need. Again, not saying don't ever have a C-section, or if you did, you're, you know, you're out of luck. But there's things that we need to do for you. Um, then triple risk of ADHD, twice the risk of autism, 80% increase of celiac disease, 50% increase of becoming obese, 70% increase of type 1 diabetes, and then just the, the side note is obesity and type 1 diabetes are both increased risk for dementia. Okay, so we have, you know, one disease leads to the next, to the next, to the next. So trying to put a stop to all of it from happening is ideal. So. How do we get all these good bacteria and how do we prevent them from being under attack? So enemies of good bacteria, environmental chemicals, and we're going to go over each one of these a little bit. Uh, so foods, so I put the SAD diet, right, so that's our standard American diet. It's unfortunate letters, but it's also <laughs> unfortunately true. What is being recommended for us is not ideal. Um, chlorinated water. So unfortunately, lots of our tap water is chlorinated and chlorine, you know, think about it, use chlorine in a pool, it's meant to kill things, right? So should we be using that in our body? Probably not. Um, and then antibiotics, right? So they've shown link between number of days of antibiotic use and an increased risk of breast cancer. Again, not saying don't ever take an antibiotic, but we need to make sure if antibiotics are taken that we, again, supplement with probiotics after the fact. And then lack of prebiotics, so this might be a new word that Lots of you have heard probiotics, but prebiotics are the food that the, the bacteria eat. So the probiotic is the bacteria in our intestine. 
prebiotic is the food that that bacteria eats. So let's say we take a probiotic, but if we don't have any food to feed that probiotic, it's not going to survive very long. So we've got some list of foods that have prebiotics in it too, so having the two in combination is ideal. And then, like we said, stress is an enemy of our good bacteria. So good stress, bad stress, happy stress, physical stress, emotional stress, the chemical reaction of our body is exactly the same every time. So something can make you really happy, and but you still have a lot of work to do on it, it's still the exact same as something that's really a disaster for you. Okay, so the emotion's different, chemical reaction, exact same on the inside. And then chronic inflammation is an enemy of the good bacteria. So again, people with autoimmune disorders, people with allergies, that's chronic inflammation going on. And then people that get injured a lot. So we've got athletes that go out and get injured every day, and they try and recover so they can injure themselves the next day, right? So a lot of inflammation going around. So here we go. So our sad diet, right? So they recommend low-fat, high-carb, which like we said, not good for our brains, and hopefully eventually we're starting to figure that out, but it might take a little bit longer for it to become uh, mainstream. Um, so they've done studies, elderly people who added good fat maintained cognitive functions better over a six-year period than people who ate low-fat diets. Right, so now think about how many elderly people you know that have been told to prevent heart disease to eat low-fat diets. Okay, the other thing is, too, any food that says well, any food product that says low fat on it is probably full of chemicals, right? So one, they've taken out the fat, which is probably something we need, and they've loaded it up with lots of chemicals to decrease that fat. So really not good things for us to eat. Also, they do it to uh, enhance the flavor of the product. Right. You know, yeah. to make it more palatable yep. for, because a lot of people are sugar addicts. Absolutely. Yep, and then to extend shelf lives too, right? So we shouldn't have. So our basically our physiology is just like a caveman. So cavemen didn't have refrigerators. They didn't amen. have ways to. <laughs> Go ahead. I just said amen, amen to that. I've been oh, trying, okay. I've been telling people that for years now. We are <laughs> we are cave people who sit in front of a computer exactly. all day long. We're not meant exactly. to do that. Exactly. Yep, we're not meant to sit all day like we, most of us do at work. We're not, so once the sun goes down, that's when we're supposed to kind of be calming down, going to sleep, but we all come inside, we turn on the lights, you know, we sit in front of a TV that has flickering lights, which affects how our brain is working, so we wake ourselves up more at night, then we're surprised when it's hard for us to fall asleep, it's a split second we want to fall asleep. But yes, but our, like I said, our physiology is the exact same like that caveman who actually had to go out and get his food every day, right, so whether it was berries, whether it was vegetables, the protein that actually had to be killed, Right? They weren't eating pasta, they weren't eating bagels, things like that. So our bodies are not meant to eat that, and they're also not meant to be sedentary, and we've managed to combine two bad things for ourselves. <laughs> and we wonder why it, people are becoming sicker and sicker. Um, so the next thing is high carb. It increases the blood sugar, which creates inflammation. Okay? Then... In the brain, sugar and brain proteins combine to produce lethal structures that degenerate the brain and its function. So uh, it, it's facts. People know this sugar is not good for us, but yet, like you said, we've become addicted to it. Like they've shown people with sugar and then various drugs, and the sugar lights up more parts of your brain than the drugs do. So yes, it's highly addictive, and we just kind of gloss over it and say, well, we should stop eating it. It can be really hard to do. But we need to make the effort to do it. I'm sure. Okay, one, not just one second here, one second here, Diane. I'm sure you've heard of the term glycation, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, so maybe you could just kind of briefly talk about what glycation is, because I think that is what leads to a lot of these uh, neurological disorders and and makes the the neuroprotective aspect of the brain weaker, you know, in relationship to you know carbs and sugars and that kind of thing. Uh, sure. Sure. Um, so did you want me to kind of yeah, just, talk, just sorry, briefly, about, briefly talk about glycation and what that is, just a little bit, and how it relates to our standard American diet? Sure. Well, so uh, the one thing I was just I wanted to say first is so we say sugar, so people assume it has to be something sweet, so like cake, donuts, cookies, things like that. The problem is the carbs that even are not sweet have 
our, they, our body turns them into sugar. Right. right? So right. bread, pasta, those are not sweet things, so not everybody associates that with sugar. So that was just one thing I wanted to say. So it's not just staying away from sweets, we got to stay away from carbohydrates in general. So the big thing is our body has essential amino acids, which are proteins. So there are certain proteins that our body cannot make that we need to ingest, whether it's in actual food or supplements. We have essential fatty acids that are, we cannot make that we need to ingest either through foods or supplements. There's no essential carbohydrates, right? No essential sugars. <laughs> our body can make thing, make that from things that we eat, okay? So that, that's the big take home is that you can live life without eating the carbohydrates, the breads, the pastas, and then of course also the sweet things. Even, even, right. even whole wheat breads, correct? Correct, yes. Correct. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. No, I like, exactly. Because a lot, um, of people ask, a lot of people ask me about that. Well, you know, I eat this really good, heavy, heavy, heavy whole wheat bread. Isn't that good for me? Sure. Yeah, so the, the question then is, how does your body break it down? What does it turn into? So a good thing to look at is a glycemic index chart. So you can just Google it. So basically, it's a list of foods, and it's given it a number. It tells you basically how much blood sugar your body creates. So one of the big things on that glycemic index that most people don't think about, carrots and grapes have really high glycemic index, which means when we digest it, it produces lots of sugar. So it, it's almost a list that might flip some people on their end and say, oh my goodness, I shouldn't eat some of these, I need to eat these. I should have put it in here and I apologize that I didn't, but just like I said, you can Google it, it's glycemic index. And it, the list of foods, the lower the number is the food that you want to be eating because it doesn't spike that blood sugar. So, and the reason that's important, so right here, increased blood sugar depletes serotonin, epinephrine, norepinephrine, GABA, and dopamine. So that's the majority of our neurotransmitters, right? So increased blood sugar depletes all of those. That's turning into a bad situation. So if you have constantly increased blood sugar, you're constantly depleting these neurotransmitters, you can see how that can be a recipe for disaster. Absolutely. Okay? Then the next thing is high blood sugar is one of the biggest risks for depression and Alzheimer's. So they're actually starting to call, so some people are starting to call Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes. Because right. they can see how the effect of blood sugar on our body is affecting our brain and turning into Alzheimer's. Okay. Um, other thing I want to say about that, so some people say, okay, diabetes, I'm not going to eat sugar, so I'm going to have diet pop, I'm going to have sugar-free this, sugar-free that. That's the even worse decision. So what happens is the artificial sweeteners are tricking our body into producing more insulin. So insulin is what handles blood sugar in our body. Okay, so when we, eat, we ingest sugar, insulin comes in, handles the situation. When we ingest an artificial sweetener, insulin comes in, it doesn't recognize it because they're not exactly the same. But insulin says, well, this isn't what I'm looking for. Where is all the sugar? So now it's triggering your body to start craving sugar because insulin is looking for sugar. Okay, so now you've eaten something diet or sugar-free, now you start craving something sweet and sugary, right? It's totally counterintuitive, but that's the way our body's working, because you got insulin running around looking for sugar, looking, and it doesn't recognize the artificial sweeteners as that. So, again, we've been harping on don't eat sugar, but I'm about to say, if you're going to have to have it, <laughs> real sugar is better than artificial sweeteners. Okay? And, and, but, better, like said, and, and better than... No fruit. sugar is better. And better than fructose. Sorry, correct. go ahead. And better than fructose. Correct. So, correct. So like high fructose corn syrup is terrible, right? So does it even sound like that's something that's good? No. But if you look at the amount of different things that it's in, uh, you know, so it's in some ketchups, it's in most sodas, it's in a number of different things because, again, it helps preserve it, it helps make it taste good, so, and it just it runs amok on our system. Okay, so anything that ends in OSE is sugar. So fructose, glucose, uh, maltose. So and you can see if you start looking at labels. So OSE is sugar. Okay. Um, so then one of the next big things that we talked about here, just a simple thing you can do for yourself is cardiologists now are in agreement with this too. Is the bigger the hit 
the waist to hip ratio, the smaller your hippocampus, which is your memory center of your brain, and the higher the risk of small strokes. Okay, so all you measure your waist, you measure your hips, and then you just divide the waist by the hip. Okay, and then basically what they're saying is for women, 0 0.081 or more, you're at a higher risk for various diseases. Okay, and then for men, it's 0.96 or more, you're at a higher risk. Okay, so just the two things on this slide, higher risk for the memory center of your brain shrinking, and the higher risk for small strokes. Right, so if we think about the elderly population, right, because that's who we usually associate with these diseases. And at, as they come on, now you have to do a lot more work to try and reverse it. So ideally it should be, you know, younger people saying, I don't want to get there, here's what I need to do on the front end instead of here's what I need to do on the back end, right? So keeping a good waist to hip ratio, right? You can do that aerobic exercise, which we know increases the neurotransmitters, helps with our gut bacteria, helps the BDNF, right? Making sure we're not eating sugar. And I'm sure these are lots of things that many people have heard before from Roberto. <laughs> but like I said, it's always nice to keep hearing the same things, like doing this could potentially cause this down the road, right? Um, then the other big thing is fat tissue pumps out hormones and inflammatory chemicals. So people are starting to refer to fat as now its own organ because it can create such problems with our hormones and inflammatory chemicals. So like I said, our hormonal cascade is not simple by any means. It's not a one, you know, fix this, this gets better. There's lots of different things in place. So now if you have a lot of fat tissue pumping out hormones that shouldn't be doing it, it makes the situation a lot harder to handle. Okay, so next thing. So I just put a little bit in here about stress um, because stress has a bad connotation, but it's important. So gravity is a stress on our body. Working out is a stress on our body. So there are good stresses that we do need. The problem is when we have stress after stress after stress after stress and our body has no time in between, right? And then as I said before, the physical, emotional, and chemical stress, exactly the same reaction in our body. That reaction is to increase cortisol, and then our immune system releases inflammatory chemicals, uh, which send our whole body into red alert. Okay? Then chronic immune activation equals chronic diseases, like allergies, MS, depression, Parkinson's, dementia, and ulcerative colitis. Okay, so what does that mean? You're in chronic stress mode, which lots of people now are, right? So a phone in your hand 24-7, always answering emails, always working never taking a break, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this, right? So now you've set your body up to be in this constant red alert situation, and now it's put some food in your mouth, and now all of a sudden you're having an allergic reaction, right? So your body can't even handle eating certain foods now because it's so revved up and so on red alert, okay? And then high levels of inflammation increase risk of developing depression, right? Oh, sorry, a little spelling mistake, but developing depression. So again, we've got depression, anxiety, memory loss, lots of these kind of seemingly common symptoms and complaints that people have that not an easy fix, right? Because it's, it's not easy to eat like this. It's not easy to manage stress properly, but it's doable, okay? Um, then this was cortisol should be the lowest at night and then rise in the morning. So anybody that's extra stressed at night right before bed, they're the complete opposite of what they should be. Right, so that cortisol is that stress hormone. You get a stressful event, it shoots up. Short term, it's really good. But now if we're getting stressed out right before bed, let's say you watch something on TV, you watch the news, it really stresses you out, now you're trying to go to bed, not going to happen. Okay? Um, then gut bacteria should inhibit the production of cytokine, uh, sorry, cytokines, which are inflammatory chemicals. So this balance of cortisol going from low to high and then the bacteria shutting off the inflammatory chemicals is the transition between our REM and our non-REM sleep, right? So again, if our cortisol is out of balance, if our gut bacteria is out of balance and our inflammatory chemicals are out of balance, we're not going to get the sleep we need, okay? okay. So bottom line of kind of everything we talked about, your gut health equals your brain health. So here's some of the things I know we kind of talked about a lot of things, but Here's some of the things that we can do to help our intestines, to help our brain. So you avoid chemical toxins, like what? Like herbicides, pesticides, artificial sweeteners. So as best you can, trying to get organic food that hasn't been sprayed with things. Just think about 
herbicides and pesticides. What are they meant to do? Kill things. So now we're putting it in our body, where our body has all these different microbes that we talked about. Now it's going to wreak havoc with that, right? So trying our best to stay away from that so our body doesn't have to fight that also. Um, then we're going to decrease our inflammation. So foods that create inflammation, fried foods, so fried chicken, french fries, processed meats um, with all the nitrates in it, you know, hot dogs, um, sugars, baked goods, carbs, right? So all those things increase inflammation. So avoiding those is ideal. Then we have, so especially with my population, people that's been injured, so any injury causes inflammation. Again, short term is good, but unfortunately, when it's with our brain, it, sometimes it's hard to get rid of that inflammation. So we have people take this supplement, I6 Factor. There's basically nine chemicals that cause pain and inflammation. This t takes care of six of them. Then number seven is cortisol, right? So if we keep that down, that helps with inflammation. Um, number eight is lactic acid. So right, so that burning pain we got from working out. Uh, so if you're getting that, you can flush that out, right? Then the last one is handled by omega-3 fats. So if you're taking algae oils, fish oils, eating the good fats like avocados, uh, salmon, tuna. Okay, then properly managing our stress. So a good way to do that is meditation. So I know that's not for everybody, but it is good. So there's meditation, there's yoga, there's things like qigong, uh, tai chi, the very purposeful movement, right? So yes, the aerobic exercise is really good at stimulating lots of different things, but we also need to make sure our body can calm down and relax nice and easy too. Um, one of the other products we have people take are I stressed out. It helps modulate that cortisol, so those instant stress hits that people get. Right? And then we increase the good fats in the diet. So avocado, tuna, salmon, coconut oil, butter, and then algae oil, fish oil supplements. And then we ha increase their probiotic and prebiotic in everyday life. So basically things on this page, when I have people that have head injuries, they come in, we do their rehab program on them, but these are things they have to do at home. So it might people come in saying, oh, well, I'm just going to come here and do this therapy. No, you've got to make big changes at home because if you're, I do this work on you, you go home and you eat your cake and you know your sweeteners and you drink your diet pops, you're destroying things that we're trying to work on. right? So you've got to make big changes at home, which is sometimes shocking for a lot of these people to hear. They don't necessarily initially understand how many changing what I'm eating is going to affect my head injury. But we go over like we did today with some of these things and then it, it makes sense for them. So this is a big part of what we have lots of people do to improve their memory, to decrease anxiety, decrease depression. So my next slide is going to be foods that have probiotics and prebiotics. So there's lots of different products that you can take. So, you know, there's kombucha, some are liquids, um, some are powdered probiotic drinks, some are capsules. So personal preference, you just got to make sure it's live cultures that you're getting. But these are some of the foods that you can eat on an everyday basis that are going to help repopulate that good bacteria. Okay, so we got live cultured yogurt, kefir, kombucha, kimchi, sauerkraut, some pickles. So you have to look. So not anymore are all pickles actually fermented. So it being fermented is what do the probiotics. Okay? And then like I said, the prebiotics, so the foods that help feed the probiotic, are going to be Jerusalem artichoke, garlic, onions, leeks, and asparagus. So Having one from each of these lists in something you eat every day is a huge step in helping that gut bacteria. Okay, and then like I said, if you, uh, I don't know if I can eat things on this list, then supplement with probiotics, just making sure it's a good one. Uh, and just real quick, the yogurt, so we're not talking about like the sweet <laughs> flavored yogurts, right? Um, it's going to be Greek yogurt, it's going to say it has live cultures in it, um, but it's not going to be, oh, well, we've got chocolate and granola and, you know, all the mixins in it too. So just want to make that clear. Um, and then that that's basically it. So if anybody has any other questions, like I said, these are not they're not impossible things. So like I said, making a big change in your diet might be hard, it might be challenging, but to say me making these changes in my life right now is going to affect me my brain health in the next five to ten years because once signs and symptoms start to show up, it becomes much harder, it's not impossible, but much harder to try and get back on the right track. So if you start now before we're having some of these symptoms, it 
it becomes much better. And then it becomes your lifestyle, so then it's no longer hard. Right? You're like, I don't need that bread. I don't need that cake. I, it's not even in the abilities right now. I have some questions. Okay. Okay, first of all, do you have a website that people can go to and just kind of see what you're doing on a regular basis? It's kind of a fluid type of thing where they can, like a newsletter or something? I'm um, sure. So we're actually in the process. We're kind of revamping it, so some of it might be under construction right now. But um, the clinic where I work, it's Concussion Care Center. So our website is concussioncare.com. Uh, like I said, that's where we started was with the concussions and the head injuries, but it's led more down a path of, the overall brain health. We've had multiple different ailments and illnesses and diseases that didn't start with concussions. That was kind of our jumping off point. So we're going through a transition. So you might see some of that on the website. But yeah, that would be the website to see where we talk about some of these things. Okay, I have another question. Now, you talk a lot about the, the low <clears throat> carbohydrate, high fat, and I assume it's moderate amounts of protein, right? It's not real, real high protein either. Oh, correct. So easy way to do it, we usually tell people the size of the palm of your hand. Okay. Right? So my hand size is probably going to be different than your hand size, Roberto. So different <laughs> protein for different right. sized people. Right. Well, okay. That, so, yeah, lead, well, that leads me, leads me to another question immediately here. What is your yeah. feeling? Now, our last webinar was on, on ketogenic diet. What is your feeling right. on being in ketosis? developing ketone bodies, which is another form of energy for the body as, as a replacement for glucose. What are your feelings on ketogenic diets? Sure. I, I think that they can be great for uh, the right type of person. And I, the big thing is just let's make sure you're being monitored by someone that knows. So you don't want to kind of put your body into this uh, mode where you're not being watched and protected, where now you're using your fat for your energy. It can be really challenging for people sometimes, but I think that it's great, especially if you have someone that can lead you through the process. You know, so just don't go try things on your own. could be a disaster. And so we want to make sure, too, any doctor that you're going to, that they feel that it's safe for you. But, yes, I do. I think that it can be really great to help people transition how their body is using energy. So, yeah, absolutely, I think that it can be a great thing. Let's just make sure everybody's doing it safely. Okay, now another one. Now we all know that we talk about the good bacteria in foods, and today we have this thing that started years ago with uh, Dr. Louis Pasteur called pasteurization, which kills a lot of the right. bacteria in foods. And um, so, should we try to avoid a lot of pasteurized foods? Sure. So the big one that comes to mind when we say pasteurized is dairy, right? So right. I'm not a big fan of dairy in general. So. <laughs> kind of the funny way to say it is what other animal as an adult drinks somebody else's mother's milk? Exactly. That's right? my feeling so there's account. no other adult animal that drinks milk, number one, and then from another animal. So I, I'm not a fan of you know drinking milk in general. Also, it acts as glue in your intestines, so it can really constipate people hmm. a lot. Okay? Uh, so I like that, that. Also, that it's pasteurized, not great. And then when they try and add in different things, right, you see like, oh, well, we added DHEA into it, or we added vitamin D into it. Well, okay, why don't I just take DHEA and vitamin D, or go out in the sun and get my vitamin D, right? So you don't have to get it from milk. Also, people say, I'm getting from my milk. Uh, you're getting the calcium that cows should have, right? Cows have multiple stomachs. <laughs> we do not. So the way we digest and process it, we're not actually getting the calcium that we're supposed to be getting from milk, right? It's supposed to be cow's calcium, not ours. So just in general, like because you said pasteurized, again, milk is the first thing that comes to mind for that. Mm -hmm. uh, not a big fan of that. But yeah, so some foods, again, to be longer shelf life, they've taken some of this out. But ideally, you know, kind of the caveman diet, right? Like what would a caveman do? Again, it becomes harder, like, okay, well, I'm not actually going to go out and kill my own food, but I'm going to the grocery store on a regular basis because my food doesn't last very long in my fridge because it's not processed to be have a long shelf life. Okay. Okay, talk to me a little bit about, uh, this is an area, one drug that a lot of people are taking, Prozac, and how right. this, all this ties into what you just discussed tonight, Prozac. 
which is an antidepressant. Uh, right, sure. So, like I said, look, unfortunately, lots of these medications are have the same side effects that their people are complaining of symptoms, right? So then it comes be hard, becomes hard to determine, okay, is the symptom getting worse? Is the medication creating the symptom? Um, but so the class of it is called SSRI, which stands for serotonin um, reuptake inhibitor. Sorry, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So bottom line, it inhibits the reuptake of serotonin, right? So which means, okay, we should have more serotonin going around. But if now your intestines aren't making serotonin because you've just stopped using it, that doesn't solve the problem. It just kind of puts a mask on it, right? It says, okay, well, we're going to stop it from being pulled into the cells as much, so now you have it here. It doesn't solve the problem. And like I said, the, this class of drugs is now kind of what's causing this whole separate constipation issue, which now we have to take something else for that. So, I again, I'm not telling people don't take it. Lots of people have been helped by it. and it is one of those things where it needs to be a conversation with between your medical provider and you know, whoever else. Well, I like to tell people that come taking, you know, if they have Prozac or they have Xanax or, you know, clonazepam, some of these sleep medications, is I don't want you to stop taking it until we can resource you some other way, right? So are we changing the way your brain waves are working? Are we changing your food habits? Are we changing how your gut bacteria is producing? the neurotransmitters so that you don't feel that you need the medication anymore, right? So just stopping those things, cold turkey, is not a good idea, right? Okay. So we need to make sure we're actually doing something else in order to solve the problem and get to the bottom of why we need it in the first place, okay? okay. So like I said, if you don't want to be taking it, then we have to find something so you can say, okay, well, what do I need to be doing instead? Not just stop taking it, because that's not going to be good for anybody. Okay. Well, guys, I want to make a shameless plug here. Dr. Donnie had talked a lot about cortisol tonight, and as most of you know, I offer that type of testing in my facility where I can, I can do your adrenal profile. So I'm making a shameless plug here, and you can see my screen. I offer hormonal and biomechanical evaluations for any of you out there who want to go a little bit deeper into what she talked about tonight. And I'm a big believer in this. I used to be just the type of person and trainer. I just thought, well, mm -hmm. just work out, eat good food, and burn calories. Well, it goes a lot deeper than that. Would you agree with that, Dr. Diana? Absolutely. And I'm sure, you know, if the listeners haven't experienced it themselves, maybe with other people, you're like, I know this person that eats perfectly, exercises, does everything right, and, you know, X, Y, Z is still a complaint. Either it's like their weight or they have memory problems. Like something still isn't falling into place. Or I'm still not sleeping. So that's when we say, okay, yes, there might be some of these underlying metabolic problems. Um, cortisol testing is great because some of the symptoms that you can have from cortisol are so wide and varied that they can fall under the umbrella of lots of different things. So I'm a big fan of having your cortisol tested, you know, especially if we're doing the saliva test. Is that how you, Absolutely. you do the saliva test? Absolutely. What that does, Absolutely. Yeah. we're taking the cortisol rhythm in the morning, noon, afternoon, and evening throughout the day. Whereas you go to a medical doctor, they'll do a, a, a blood test on you, but it's just a one-time deal. They'll tell you your, cor your total cortisol, but they will not give you the fluctuations throughout the day in the rhythm of your cortisol, which is also a huge factor in how well you sleep at night, guys. Right, absolutely. So, yeah, I love that you're doing that. And it's easy test, guys. Like you kind of you spit in a tube <laughs> at various right. times during the day. So that saliva is much more sensitive for testing cortisol than the blood. And like you said, you want to see this bell curve throughout the day. And as we mentioned, at night when it should be at its lowest, most people, that's when it's the highest. And that's exactly not what's supposed to be happening. Right, so now we have in people with insomnia, they can't fall asleep or they wake up multiple times in the middle of the night, right? And so if you're trying all these sleep medications, which again, just kind of knock you out and your cortisol is not being addressed, it, so it's not going to fix the problem, right? You stop taking the sleep medication, you still can't sleep. So yeah, I, I think that's great if you have a chance, have Roberto check that for you. That'd be fantastic. It's always good to have your stamp of approval, Diana. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, guys, I'm going to wrap it up tonight. We ran a little bit over. Uh, September 13th, <laughs> Dr. Evan Maladinov will be speaking, who was the father of this young lady tonight. Dr. Dinah Maladinov, he is the dad. Dr. Evan Maladinov on September 13th, he's going to talk about the estrogen, progesterone, testosterone balance, and how it relates to prostate and breast cancer. So make sure you tune in for that. September the 13th, that will also be at 8 o'clock. I want to thank everybody for attending for tonight's session. And tell your friends about it, tell your family, tell some people you like, tell some people you don't like. Get them here next time. All right? You guys take care and God bless. Thank you, Diana. Thanks, Roberto. Have a good night. All right. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody.